in connection to Krishna. Then you get what's called purification, and that's described in another famous verse that Rupa Goswami offers us in the book called Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and it goes like this, Sarvo Padi Vanir Muktam Tapratvayana Nirmalam Sevanam Bhakti Ruchide. So uh, it means that you ga- engage all the senses, when you engage all the senses in Krishna's service or any of them, because of Krishna's purifying uh, nature, then our senses become purified and we become illuminated. And this is the way to become uh, situated in our original Krishna consciousness. So there are practical aspects to engaging the knowledge gathering and working senses in Krishna's service. So as an example, we have the tongue and we have the ears. So the tongue can be used for uh, repeating the names of God. They're sacred and they're uh, very powerful spiritually. So as an example, you see this mantra printed at the top of the screen. It goes like this, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So if you repeat that, you're serving God, Krishna, with your tongue. And as mentioned in a very ancient literature that speaks about bhakti yoga, Atashri Krishna Namadi Nabaved Grayam Indriye Seva Mukhi Jipado Swayameva Spratyada. The first sense that you should engage in the service of God is the tongue. And if you engage the tongue, then all the other senses will follow. It's a nice hint to have, isn't it? So the tongue actually does two things. You can speak with it. And what else do you do with your tongue? You taste. So that's another preoccupation of all living entities. They like to eat. And you can make friends with anybody just as on the side if you feed them nice, nicely. They'll become your friend. They'll become loyal to you if you feed them. So one of the other aspects of yoga is what you eat. So it's very special what we eat in bhakti yoga. We don't just eat any old food, but we eat food that's been cooked with the idea of offering it to Krishna. Krishna being the supreme personality of Godhead, he has transcendental and unlimited senses. And that means his senses are unlimited. For instance, if you offer something to God, like here, like if I had an apple and I held it out, I said, with all my heart, I said, I offer this to God. Do you think he could reach it from wherever he is? Yes? Yes. And that's what the ancient Upanishads say also, that tarejati tanaijati tanantarasya sarvasya that God is far away, but he's very near his will. He's within everything, and yet he is outside of everything. And he can uh, reach to any place that we are and take whatever offering we're putting up for him. And so when we eat food in bhakti yoga, it's a celebration for feeding Krishna. We cook it with the idea, not that we're going to eat it, but that Krishna's going to eat it. And so we cook it with love and devotion and that consciousness And then we make an offering, and we make a prayer. Krishna, please accept this food. And then he takes it. And after he takes it, the food becomes transcendentalized. So when you eat it, it's not just regular food, but it's actually the same quality as Krishna, because whatever he touches becomes spiritual. So you can have spiritual food. Does anybody like food in general? Okay, I'll raise my hand on that one. And how about if you were able to eat food and also become purified and become spiritually minded? Would you like that? On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 means the best idea you ever heard, and 1 means you're not interested, in which case we won't feed you in about an hour and a half. So I'm taking count of who says that. Who thinks it's a, a way up there by 10? Okay, I, we, I see you online there. Very good. Excellent. So it's a good way to get fed, too. Be very enthusiastic about prasadam. And that's what it's called. Prasadam means grace. It means that we're getting the favor of God just by eating. That's nice. So if you're able to use your tongue in Krishna's service a little bit every day by repeating the names of God 
And then take a little trouble. It's actually a very sweet process to offer things before you eat them. And you can make a little special arrangement. It takes an extra step. And in that extra step comes all the spiritual benefit. Instead of just going directly from the stove into your mouth, then you take the time to put something together to offer to Krishna very consciously. And you see your life will change yeah, for the better. You'll become happy. So those are two aspects of bhakti yoga that deal with the tongue. And then what about the legs or the feet? Their senses also. We ambulate with our feet. We go from place to place. And so that's why we have this temple. There's all of you used your, the senses called the feet today or legs to walk to the temple. At least you walked a few feet after you got out of your car. And that means you use them in Krishna's service. So there's a famous place in Vrindavan called Govardhan Hill. Who wants to go to Govardhan Hill? All right, let's go. <laughs> we go to Govardhan Hill, and if you go to Govardhan Hill, then there's an opportunity that you can walk around, use your feet to walk around, and it's a way of worshiping Krishna. <laughs> Confirmed. You walk around Krishna in the form of a hill, and you use your feet. And then for using your arms, let's just say when I walked in here a little earlier, there were some uh, very advanced devotees. I saw them and they were sweeping the floor in the temple. Now, <laughs> sweeping sometimes, you know, if you go to a, a, a gathering somewhere and people are like, well, what do you do professionally? I'm a IT, I'm a doctor. I teach at Stanford. What do you do? I sweep floors. Well, that may not seem like a very desirable kind of profession, but there's a story of a king named Prachaparudra. He lived in Jagannath Puri. He was the king of Jagannath Puri. And when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was there, and every year in Puri they hold a Rathayatra, and King Prachaparudra came out and out of humility, and of course, sweeping in India and the position of a sweeper is regarded much differently than a sweeper anywhere else. You're a bungi. You're like untouchable practically because you're always touching dirty stuff, sweeping this, that. So the king took the, that humble position of a sweeper and he came with a golden broom, which was befitting for sweeping before Lord Jagannath, and he swept the pathway before the Rathiatra cart would take off and go on uh, Lord Jagannath's ride to Vrindavan. And because of that, he attained the favor of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who I mentioned before is Krishna himself. So if you become a sweeper for Krishna, who would like to be a sweeper for Krishna? Who would like to be one of the straws in the broom of somebody who's a sweeper for Krishna? He, you raise your hand first, you win. So uh, sweeping, can be a kind of devotional service if you sweep for Krishna. If you get interested in sweeping this temple, then you'll feel kind of a, a satisfaction in the heart because you're using the senses, your arms and your feet too, to sweep the Lord's temple. How about uh, washing pots? Best service you can get besides sweeping. And if you get in and you just put your head down and you wash pots, you're using your arms, and um, as you're cleaning the pots, then you'll be cleaning your heart, too. Because the pots that are all used in this kitchen, they're only used for cooking for Krishna. So they're transcendental pots. I can prove it through Shastra, shall I? What it means is I have to quote a verse that proves that if you use a seemingly ordinary item in the service of God, then that item becomes spiritualized. Do you challenge me to do that? Okay. Brahmarpanam Brahmaha Vir Brahmagnau Brahmanohutam Brahmaiva Tenagantavyam Brahmakarma Samadhinam. This verse proves it. It means that when you use something in the service of Krishna, even though it may appear to be a material item, it becomes spiritualized. So if you use a pot for Krishna to cook for him, the pot may look like a regular steel pot, but actually that steel becomes spiritualized. 
And if you pick up a regular looking broom and you use it to sweep Krishna's temple, the broom becomes transcendentalized. And if you use your body and all your senses to serve Krishna, then they become transcendentalized. And then you walk around with a transcendental body. Even though you're in a so-called material body, it transforms. And I'll give you an example. If you take an iron rod and you put that rod into hot fire and you leave it there, after some time, the iron transforms and it becomes red hot. Have you ever seen that? Where did you see it? On TV. <laughs> I saw it in Japan, up in Takayama. You can all come to Japan, too. You're all welcome. We'll have a tour to Japan soon, too. As soon as they open back up, everyone can come to Japan. You want to come? Okay, let's go. So we're going to go to Japan. And when we do, we're going to go to the mountains. And we're going to go up to Takayama. And there, they still have blacksmiths who uh, form, they forge steel in hot fire, and then they bend it into various shapes and use it for various kinds of uh, tools, implements of uh, myriad, for myriad causes. And so I saw it in the early part of the day. They were putting the rods in the fire. And we came back later, they were glowing hot. And they had transformed. Their nature was no longer iron, but now it was fire. So the more we keep ourselves connected to Krishna through serving, using our senses, the more the senses become transcendentalized. They become purified. And with purified senses, we can see Krishna. As it said in the Sri Brahma Samhita, Premanjana Chudita Bhakti Vilochanena, Santaksa Daiva Hrdeyeshu Vilokayanti, Yam Shama Sundara Machincha Gunasvarupam Govindamadi Purusham Maham Bajami. When your eyes get transformed through spiritual engagement, and it's a metaphor used here, it's like if you have a little, have you ever put a little tincture like eye drops in your eyes? You ever had that? So you get some eye drops you can put in. So what you do when you're using your eyes to serve Krishna and all your senses, then you get this little bottle on the side. It says prema, love, love for Krishna. You put those drops in your eyes and you have prema, prema vision. That could be a TV station, prema vision. And then, then, when you, then when you look, you see Krishna everywhere out of love. And... And you know, we kind of have an example of that, too. Let's just say that you have uh, a little child that you love. So wherever you look, you see, like, something that reminds you of the child. For instance, if you see a little pair of shoes somewhere and you think, oh, my little girl, my little boy, then, you know, immediately think of those who wake up that dormant love for Krishna that's there within their hearts, then wherever they look, anywhere in the world, they're reminded of Krishna and they think, oh, Krishna. I love Krishna. And they want to do more service for Krishna. This is real happiness. And this is the goal of the practice of bhakti yoga. Right now I have love for myself and I have, or my mistaken sense of self, my body. I love my body because I'm in it. But as soon as I leave the body, I won't care a fig for it. What does that mean? Well, figs put out a lot of fruit and no one really cares that much because there's so many thousands of fruits that come off the tree and they're so inexpensive that if you lose one fig, it's not a big deal. So when we leave our body, we don't care a fig for it anymore. It's about that valuable to us. And that just shows because we're in it, it's valuable. But what if you came to know the soul of your soul? That's Krishna. And we just have to turn our attention back around from being focused on my body as the self to understand that I'm actually the conscious being within the body. I'm not the body. And then we have to ascertain and be able to perceive how I have a source to my own self. And it has a purpose. So there are a couple of ways that you can conduct your life in general category, categorical terms. So one way is that you can come up with your own plan. Did anybody come up with their own plan for your life? Did it work out perfectly? Not so much? Okay. Then there's Krishna's plan. So Krishna has a plan. Now here's an insider secret. 
I only pass this on to insiders, and since you came all the way here today and you joined online, I'm going to impart this secret to you. I learned it from a book I read, and that is that we actually don't have our own plan because we're always instruments. So there's Krishna's plan, wait for it, and then there's Maya's plan. Maya means personified illusion. And she comes up with a plan for us. Here you go. And like, okay, I'll do this. And it's not actually our plan. I think I'm acting independently, but actually Maya's writing me a little script and saying, psh, 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 psh. and then I follow that plan and I always fail. We are what's called a marginal energy. We're always in an instrumental position. So we can be instrumental for Krishna or we can be instru instrumental for illusion. And so there's Krishna's plan and there's illusion's plan. We don't really get our own plan because we're part of something bigger. And I'll give you an example. Just like the finger on my hand is part of something bigger. What's it part of that's bigger than itself? What would you say? Well, the arm, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's true. And then thinking like in bigger terms now. It's part of the body. Now, what's the duty of the finger? Yeah, if I say, finger, please come here, what's it supposed to do? It's supposed to come. Come to me. It's like, finger, could you touch that bottle? And it's like, no, nah, I don't think so. Uh, like, if you ever wake up in the morning and like, finger, uh, could you uh, switch the light on? And it goes, I'm not working today. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to turn on the light. And maybe your finger's paralyzed or it just doesn't work anymore. It can no longer serve in its capacity as a finger. Or let's say worse, if somehow or other somebody's, I said somebody because we don't know who it is, their finger gets cut off. And once the finger's cu cut off, and let's just say, you know, anyway, I don't want to get too graphic here. Let's just say the finger's separated from the body. How much value is there? Like if you don't know where the body is, the body moved on, it was on a train or something like that. See, I'm getting graphic. Okay, so then the finger and the body are separated. How valuable is the severed finger? You said not that much, but how much is it worth? <laughs> Your opinion is zero. It's worth zero. It doesn't... It doesn't have any value whatsoever unless you know where to connect it to. And if that body has moved on, it's in another station and no one even knows when it fell off, then there's no more value in the finger. It's severed, it's gone, it's disconnected. So when I'm in a state of being disconnected from my service to follow Krishna's plan, then I feel like I don't have any value. In fact, it's a major problem nowadays. I was just reading recently about how there's an epidemic amongst uh, especially young people in various parts of the world where they feel worthless. They feel like life's an empty void, and they feel very depressed because they don't feel a sense of purpose. So problem is, and it's a problem for everybody, we get cut off from our service to Krishna. So... When we are able to reconnect to Krishna through the practice of bhakti yoga, then we feel immediately a sense of purpose. And one of the symptoms of somebody who's embraced the process of devotional service is that he or she feels transcendental pleasure. It's the first thing. You feel happy. And you feel a sense of relief also, because there's a big burden to try to pretend you're the body. And there's also a lot of debt that we carry around. Anybody here go to school and you get a student debt left over afterwards? Or is you all, were you all able to pay it right off immediately? I mean, I know some really good doctors and they still owe $350,000. How long does it take to pay that off? Approximately. Huh? Four or five years? That's pretty good. Doctors out there. <laughs> so the debt we carry from one life to the next is way more than student debt. 
it's so much that you can't calculate it all with one calculator. You need some supercomputer, and even that won't do it. It'll burn out trying to figure out how much debt we have from all our previous lives. And that all comes to bear when we come out in the world and you know, you ask the little baby, why are you crying? It's like, I'm already in debt. I, just, I was just born 10 minutes ago. That's why they cry. You didn't know that? Yeah, they come out of the womb and then it's like, what's wrong? And it's like, I'm in debt already. I just came out into the world. And that's a fact. We're all debtors. So the Srimad Bhagavatam says, Devarshi Bhutapnandrinam Pitrinam the Kinkaro Nayam Nrini Charajan Sarvatmana Yasharanam Sharanyam Gatomukundam Parihritakartam. Is that the way to liquidate all your debt is to take Krishna's plan, not Maya's plan. Maya's got more debt in mind for you, the way to rack up more debt. So when you take Krishna's plan, and his is really simple, he just says, do what I say and follow my path and I'll absolve you of all your debt. And that's why devotees feel happy. Say, I'm happy. happy. See? Proof positive. And that's because you got no more debt. It all, everything, you just sign it over to Krishna. Say, whatever you say, I do. Whatever your plan is, that's my plan. And that's devotional service. Very simple. And then you're happy all the time. You have no more debt. And you can go about your business sweeping the floor, washing pots, and nobody can bug you because you've got your plan in mind and you're lined up. And then the life isn't such a burden anymore. You're happy. And how happy are you? You're so happy that you, get, you feel great joy every day in expressing gratitude to Krishna by chanting his name. So many devotees who have this, they have this system where in the beginning of the day, they start saying the name of Krishna over and over again. They go like this. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. But they don't just do it one time. They do it 1,725 times. What? 1,728? What did I say? 1,728? What did I say? I got to make up some extra rounds. <laughs> like 50 years worth. <laughs> I won't see you guys for a while. I'm going to a cave up on Mount Diablo. <laughs> so the devotees, they feel gratitude and they saying Krishna's names, feeling connected with him, cooking for him. They invite people over. They're like normal people, but they're not normal at all. There's, they're paranormal. They're above normal. There's uh, above the material world. So they have people over, but when the people come over, they don't watch TV and talk about movies and stuff like that. They sit down and say, let's read some Bhagavatam. I had a friend named Ruchi. It's a good name for him because he had a taste. And that was his main mantra. Whenever we'd meet, he goes, let's read some Bhagavatam. He just wanted to hear from the Bhagavatam about Krishna. And so that's what devotees do in their spare time. They hear and chant about Krishna. Then somebody cooks something, offers to Krishna. Everyone has a good time uh, eating together, but it's Krishna Prashadam. And then you can have kirtan and sing Krishna's names. And you get all the same aesthetic pleasure or pleasure that comes from the aesthetic beauty of music you know, being you know, different tunes and rhythms and everything like that. But you're in a transcendental realm because you're chanting Krishna's names instead of you know, some Bollywood thing where it's, you know, lovey-dovey, so-called, and then you know it's going to be a disaster for these people. So that's the simple process of devotional service that anybody can take to, and that's what we offer here at it's kind of Silicon Valley, and everyone uh, can take to it and practice uh, Krishna consciousness. What do you think? Okay, yes. We have a, several votes. About one-third of you voted. That's about right. Usually it's about 30% in, in America vote. <laughs> well, what, do you, what would you like to do? Would you like to try chanting? Yeah. Okay, chanting Hare Krishna is not ordinary. It's transcendental. Because Krishna and his name are non-different. So when you say Krishna, Krishna is dancing on your tongue. He's already in your heart. He's already within every atom. 
But there's something special about saying his name. Just like if we say your name, and let's just say you heard somebody talking in the hallway out there, and then they're, they're saying uh, things over and over again. You can't quite tell what they're saying. And this is how you do it if you're trying to make in a play and make it sound like you're just talking and not saying anything. You say, rhubarb, hubbub, subbub. Say it, rhubarb, hubbub, subbub. Everyone keeps saying it. But not in unison, everyone. You See, it sounds like a room full of people talking, right? <laughs> and amongst the people talking, rhubarb, hubbub, subbub, rhubarb, and all of a sudden you hear your name, John. And you go, well, John, what, what, they said my name, John. And it's like over here, Dilip, oh, you know, so... <laughs> As soon as you hear your name, your ears perk up. It's like, hey, they're talking about me over there. So Krishna, when he hears us chanting his name, then he takes, it, takes notice. Like, oh, he's saying my name. And he's present with us through his name. So this is one of the uh, sim most simple processes of yoga is just to repeat God's name. And it's highly recommended in the ancient uh, literatures, like the Brihat Naradiya Purana says, this gives this emphatic statement. Harinama, 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 Eva Kevalam. Kalau Nasteva, Nasteva Nasteva, Gatiranyata. It means there's only one way to achieve perfection in this present age of Kali Yuga, and that's by chanting. And it says it three times by chanting, by chanting, by chanting. Only way, only way, only way. So let's try it. We're going to have to do the China tune, I think. You could put a stand mic over there, too. Everyone ready? Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gaura Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
That tune came from China. <laughs> now, um, we had a, a discussion about uh, devotional service and bhakti yoga. And we tried out the chanting. And now we can try uh, following the footsteps of the sages at Naimasharanya. Let me tell you who they are. These are the most sp special souls. Most special? They're special souls who gathered in a forest for the purpose of discerning how to do the greatest good to the most number of people in the world and to find out what was the most direct route. Being that we don't have much time in Kali Yuga. And they asked the questions. So let's try asking questions and we'll try answering by giving the, the version that's in the Bhagavad Gita to answer the questions. So we have a 50-50 stake in this next part of the conversation. Is everybody ready? Yes. You have to ask good questions. I have to give a good answers. If I give a bad answer, then I'm out. If you give a bad question, you're out. <laughs> then we'll have to chant more. OK. Who would like to start? Oh, that was intimidating. OK. Oh, you're not intimidated. Go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I will try my best. <laughs> um, if someone has just seven more days to live, or maybe some few moments to live, what is the thing that person can do um, that is the best thing he can do? Yeah, that was the exact question that Prichit Maharaj asked to Shukadev Goswami. And Shukadev Goswami said that the best thing to do is to remember Narayan, Krishna, and prepare for that. And he said, Etan nirvidyamananam ichitam akatobayam yoginam nirpanirnitam harir namanukirtanam. You'll be happy to know that he said that there's a process that's already been vetted. Means it's already been, he's, he affirms that it's been gone through exhaustively, and it's been decided amongst the authorities that the best possible way to do this, to remember God, Krishna, at the time when one leaves this world, is to do the, what we just did, is to chant Hare Krishna. So, etan nirvidyamananam ichatam akatobayam yoginam nirpanirnitam harinam anirkirtanam. Whatever position of life you're in, he's naming various stations of life. It's good for everybody. It works always in all places, and anybody can do this. And so he said, this is the way that you could attain perfection, is by chanting the holy name. So it's a highly recommended process that one chant Hare Krishna. So you can organize the chanting in your, in your own house. You don't have to have, of course, you get one of these. It's pretty nice. Uh, you're like a one-man band. And you can have a tambourine, or you can just use your hands. So if you gather together in your home and you clap and just sing with your family members or a friend, and you can say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Then you'll be purified and uplifted by the transcendental vibration, and you'll immediately remember Krishna because Krishna and his name are non different. And then the other way of chanting is that uh, does anybody uh, have Japa beads? Yeah, if you could stand up over here, please. Everyone, please say, Go Ranga. Thank you very much. OK, so these are a string of beads. And Mukharavinda Prabhu is holding onto his beads, and he'll grasp them with his right hand and hold be one of the beads between his middle and uh, th finger and thumb. And then he'll say a mantra. Let's hear you say a mantra. Hare 
Note for those who couldn't hear, he was chanting the Hare Krishna Ma Mantra. Let it be on the record. And so you'd chant one mantra on that bead, and then you'd move, you'd pull with your thumb, and you move forward to the next bead, and then do it again. Thank you, Mukharavin. <laughs> this is another way to chant Hare Krishna, uh, the, where you can measure how many times you chant. So, 1,000, so he chants at least that, the way he chanted that mantra, he might chant a little uh, more quickly, but at least every, every day he at least chants it 1,728 times. I knew that. I knew that. I was just testing you all earlier. So, and, and so, if you get in the rhythm of chanting like that, you'll enter into a zone, a spiritual zone, where you'll, you'll feel yourself uh, one-minded with the mantra. You'll feel that it's a spiritual uh, vibration, and you can sense Krishna's presence with you. Now you're starting to get contact directly with Krishna through his name. And then, uh, by doing that, naturally you'll start to see how you have spiritual strength. And you also start to get a taste for the chanting. Uh, you'll clear up a lot of misconceptions in your life and you'll be a better person. Like if you ever been at home for a long period of time and you couldn't go out, does this sound familiar? You're at home for a long period of time, you couldn't go out, you're a little crowded, you don't like the way other people chew at breakfast. And it's like, do you have to chew like that? You know, you won't say that after you chant your japa. You'll be like, yeah, you can chew however you want. I'm happy. Uh, you'll feel satisfied within, uh, a sense of satisfaction. Uh, every, you'll have enough. You'll feel like I'm a soul, and I'm a servant. I'm happy. There's, there's so many. This is pr very preliminary benefits from chanting Hare Krishna, but everything good comes from the chanting. So this is what to do uh, to uh, get ready for the final moment, which is when we have to leave this body, which is inevitable because we don't get to keep it. It's a temporary residential thing. So uh, while we're in it, we have the wherewithal to develop our consciousness. And the best way is by chanting. And then you can also hear from Bhagavad Gita. I recommend that you read Bhagavad Gita every day. Don't skip a day. Because Bhagavad Gita is very clear, it's very straightforward, and it will reform your intelligence so that you'll able to, you're able to look at the world the, through the eyes of Krishna. And when you do that, then you see the world in a whole different light. You'll be kinder to living beings because you'll see their spiritual uh, souls. They're going through their karma in this world. You'll also not be attached to the fruits of your work because, after all, it doesn't belong to us anyway. We're like bank tellers. We're counting the money. We don't keep it. We don't put it in our pockets. And you become a, a whole, complete, uh, mature, uh, spiritual human being, which is what the world needs right now. We don't need a bunch of immature babies running around screaming at each other, right? We don't need people throwing stuff across the room at each other, shooting stuff at each other, stuff like that. We'd rather have spiritually minded people, right? Okay, so everyone should chant Hare Krishna. Good question. You don't get kicked out. Okay. Yes, Prabhu. You need the bottle? Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, wonderful lecture. I really like the point that you made the analogy of a severed finger. The value of a severed finger is zero uh, when it's similar to a person who is detached from the main purpose. So my question is based on the lecture that you mentioned if one takes Krishna's plan, that the eternal debt will be absolved. But the question is, how do we know it's a Maya's plan or Krishna's plan? Sometimes it may look like Krishna's plan, and Maya may take over in the middle. How do we protect that? Check with the Bhagavad Gita. That's Krishna's plan. It, Bhagavad Gita has never been changed. It's always the same. And the reason is that, the, uh, the sadhus, the great acharyas, teachers, have watched it very carefully over the... They've, they've protected that text. It's not corrupted at all. It's not been um, interfered with at all. It's Krishna's direct words. 
And if you read Bhagavad Gita every day, then you'll have a clear idea what Krishna's plan is. And that's the best way. Actually, Bhagavad Gita is called the Vedic intelligence. All of the intelligence that's being presented through the, the Vedas, which is a vast uh, literature, is available in the succinct uh, dialogue called the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna speaking directly. I mean, after all, think about it. Krishna is directly there. Arjuna is directly there. He's a pure devotee listening to Krishna. And Krishna is answering all his questions. And simultaneously, he's answering all of ours. Because Arjuna is doing us a favor. He's asking Krishna all these. And it goes on the record. And there we have the record. So you can read Bhagavad Gita every day. And then you'll have a really clear idea of whether you're following Krishna or Maya. Then there's other ways, too. There's two other ways. You can triangulate. So... The other way is if you find somebody who's an attorney for Krishna. An attorney knows the law books. If you go to an attorney, they always have books in their room. And he, that you'll notice, you know, they're on camera, wherever, law books everywhere. Why? Because you got to go to law school and you have to learn the law books. And every attorney who is worth his or her salt has studied those books and knows how to refer to them. So you may go through the Bhagavad Gita, you may have questions about it, but go to an attorney and look at, see if they have a diploma that they got in the Bhagavad Gita, have they lived it. This is called Shabde Brahma Chanishnatam, somebody who's actually listened to it so deeply, which means that they're actually following it, that they're Nishnatam, they're situated in spiritual life firmly. They're not messing around. They put the toys up on the shelf and now... They're very serious about the process. So then there's one more, okay, there's the third, and that is all the practitioners who follow Bhagavad Gita. So there may be an attorney you go to called a guru, and you say, uh, please tell me, is this right? I'm reading Bhagavad Gita, am I doing it right? The guru will confirm, and then you can see what do the other saintly type persons do? Not just saintly type, they're actually saintly because they dedicate their whole lives. What is the pattern of their lives? Does it match up with what I'm thinking? So this is called Guru, Sadhu, Shastra. You have three ways to triangulate and figure out if you're in Maya or you're actually following Krishna's plan. Workable? Can work. You can work that. Excellent, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Sri Antariksha Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Uh, thank you very much for the class. Um, I have a general question. Um, is it necessary that one needs to have a love of Godhead or Prema to be able to go back home, back to Godhead? Yeah, yeah, it's necessary. But it's not like... Um, it, it, it's our natural uh, condition. When we have full attraction for Krishna and... We're fully invested in, in him. We have no other, uh, we're, we love him. Uh, then the accommodation is that we, we can stay with him. Uh, you know, until I have this uh, complete attachment to Krishna, then I'm partly attached here, partly attached to Krishna. So when we're no longer attached to anything else but Krishna, then we're always with Krishna whether in this world or in the next world, and we're fully accommodated in that way. So it's just by degrees. I mean, it's not uh, like uh, getting a visa or something like that. I mean, it kind of is like getting a visa in a way, but it's not mechanical. Uh, it's it's a, a personal exchange between us as souls and God, Krishna. And there's... Um, an eternal loving relationship we have with him. And so in our natural state, we love God. And when, it's, when we're distracted and we love something else, then we feel really disappointed and ripped off and we feel like somebody, somebody's doing something to us. Like how, how could things be so messed up? And there's a question asked by the Avanti Brahmana when he says, if you bite your own tongue, who do you get to blame? can blame your teeth or whomever. 
So uh, when we come to this stage of really deciding that we love Krishna or we want to love Krishna and we just follow him, then, you know, back to Godhead means really everything is part of the kingdom of God, actually, even in the material world. And uh, when, one so when somebody's fully satisfied by deciding within him or herself that I'm going to serve Krishna no matter what, even if you can't do it very well externally, and even if you still have a lot of leftover uh, psychological nonsense floating around, but you still have that core feeling that that's it, I'm already surrendered to Krishna, even though there's space junk banging around in my head. I'm still, I'm still on the path back to Godhead, and I'm also still satisfied, even while I'm in this world. And in fact, the Bhagavatam says, and I'll quote, Narayana paraksarvena kutashchana bhibhyati, swarga pavarga narakeshu apituliyarti darshina. For a person who uh, feels that exclusively the main purpose of my life is to serve Lord Narayan, then whether he or she is in heaven or hell, uh, that person is not concerned with the external environment. And generally, I mean, Krishna comes to this world. We know, like he came to Vrindavan, he performed his pastimes there in Mathura and also in Dwarka. There are stories about that. So Krishna comes and he performs his pastimes here and some devotees, they join him there in uh, Vrindavan or Mathura or Dwarka and they become part of those pastimes. And those who try really hard in this life and they don't quite make it, uh, that's okay. You get to start where you left off. Just like on Dandavat Parikram, you put a rock down and then you offer a base, you get to start you know, where you put the marker. So you, you get a little time out, then you come back into a new family right here in ISV. And you know, somebody's, like you're in the womb and somebody's reading, and like, Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. And it's like, hey, I recognize that. I must be back in the association of devotees. And when the little kid comes out, it's like, give me the Madunga. You know, give me some cartels now. You know, it's like, hey, you're like six months old. <laughs> At least let me chew on them. So, uh, you know, the person comes back into the fold of where the sound vibration is. Krishna arranges that. Karmana daivanetrina, jantur deho papatye, stri pravishta udaram, pumso reta kanashraya. It's all arranged where we're going to go in our next life by higher authority. You don't get to decide. Uh, let me see, I'd like to be born as a uh, really wealthy person in New York. And it's like, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> you can go to New York, but you're going to be a little rat. You know, it's like, how do you like that? Oh, I don't like that very much. Well, you should have thought about that earlier, right? So, uh, you know, everything's in Krishna's hands. When he wants us to go somewhere or go back to Godhead, Whatever we're into service, and so devotees desire to be with Krishna. But wherever there's service for Krishna, like we like it here in Silicon Valley, because there's service here. We have a big vision that in Silicon Valley we'll keep expanding the community. We'll have projects that are solidly rooted, like educational projects, so young people can be educated from the time they're young and go all the way through high school in a private Hare Krishna school. It's already happening, you know, the foundational parts of that. We can have a place where we have performing arts, where all the time we have uh, the presentation of aesthetic, aesthetically beautiful presentations of music and drama, like we had the other night, a drama it just carried us away. We can have that. We can have places like to train people in an academy. There's lots of people in the Silicon Valley would like to have a place where they could come and take a full training, like people take yoga t teacher training all the time now. They come and learn bhakti yoga from uh, A to Z. And then uh, they can also teach it to other people. And we'll have a campus. And there's uh, places where we can serve prasadam. So we have this vision, all of us, something here in Silicon Valley. So we really would like to stay here for a while and work together to see that everybody here, we don't want to go anywhere until everyone has a set of Srimad Bhagavatams. And I think you already covered...
Cupertino, so. <laughs> I, I think Cupertino and Mountain Home are already finished, so you can. <laughs> so, so we we only have like you know a couple thousand more neighborhoods to cover, and we can do it. We just have to really organize and put our energies into it, and that that's really nice to actually be in a place where Krishna consciousness is needed, and then uh, we have an inkling that this is real. It's actual medicine. It, it actually changes people's lives for the better. It cures them of the disease, and then we get to be on the front lines to distribute it. And uh, you know, if you die thinking like that, Krishna. Will Make some arrangements for you. Okay, so now, pardon me? Okay, Bhaktin Vatsala has a question on Zoom, all the way from Toronto. Hare Krishna. Hare, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my heartfelt obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question. Um, my English is not very good, and I'll try to um, phrase it nicely. So, uh, Let's say someone, when someone is mad at us and angry at us, and they could be devotees, they could be potential devotees, um, who would be devotees in some other life. But um, so when someone is angry, they're holding like a burning coal in their hand. But you know, like I know that like the person who is mad at me is not bad from within. He's just angry because of certain things or she's angry because of certain things it could be a situation at workplace how do i show the sign of acceptance uh, like you just mentioned in the beginning of the class that uh like we all like we all are uh, the creation of the lord and if i love him and i love everything about him or like i mean all his creations so I also love the person who is right now mad at me. So how, I mean, I'm here it is not gambling of, of like a moment or, or a time. Here it is about that the person who is mad is suffering. So what is that sign? What is that thing that I should do uh, or we should do to calm that angry person down, uh, calm that person, angry person, um, calm down that angry person. Um, how, to how to calm down an angry person. You could yes. write, write a book with that title. <laughs> we'll do a YouTube series. How to calm down an angry person. <laughs> calm down, little fella. <laughs> you know, it depends. It depends on the circumstance and your relationship. Sometimes people become... John? Offer prasadam. Okay. Sometimes if people are really angry, we just, you know, actually, Bhagavatam says if people feel kind of inimical towards us, if, if it's because of Krishna consciousness, it says don't, don't poke around. Just let them give a wide berth so they can go around you. And uh, it really depends on the circumstance, how to calm down an angry person. But generally, uh, the, the advice that Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita 12th chapter is don't become your enemy's enemy. If somebody becomes your enemy, don't become their enemy. And it doesn't mean also that you have to go and sit on their doorstep until they give up their anger. You can just leave it alone. A lot of times people, you know, in the old days, people used to write an angry letter. Was anybody alive when you used to write letters? You're all so young, you don't know this. Yeah, okay. So people, let me tell you, kids, people used to write letters. There was paper, and we had pens, and then when you write, write to somebody, you write the letter, and then you fold it up three times, you put it in an envelope. Envelopes were these little, you know, uh, things that had uh, some glue on it, and you put a little water, and then you seal it, and then you had to put a stamp and an address and put it in a box. That's a lot of work, right? So you write an angry letter, and then the next day you'd wake up and think, I'm not going to send that. What was I thinking last night? Nowadays, you get an angry thought, and you go, boom! <laughs> and next thing you know, you got 50,000 responses, like, you idiot, you know? <laughs> and your reputation is ruined, you have to quit your job, you can't go on TV anymore, everything's done. So <laughs> anger is very dangerous. You just leave it alone. It's like fire. You have to be really careful not to meddle with it 
and, and get involved. But there are different ways and different circumstances with people to help them to calm down. If it's your spouse or somebody you're living with, you know, better thing is to wait for a time to have when you can have cool uh, conversation. And then to have regular conversations preemptively so that you know you can understand one another. I hope that helps a little bit. I could say more about it if I do a little show called How to Calm Down an Angry Person. <laughs> I'll think about it more. And now we're going to have a little kirtan, and we'll do that uh, thing we did at Sadhu Sangha the last time. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Okay, we'll have a little more chanting because this is, besides prasadam, another way to calm down an angry person is to give them a little kirtan. Everyone ready? Here we go. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare.
everybody for coming to the Sunday afternoon program and now we get to uh, dance for Krishna and when you dance and clap for Krishna all the birds of any leftover karma they go flying away and any uh, uh, money keys watches and stuff that are in your pocket when you're dancing comes flying out we're gonna put it in the hundi for you <laughs> so dance hard okay so now we'll move all the uh, asans out of the way and clear the dance floor and we'll start up again in not less than two minutes. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. She's back. Yes, she's back. Oh, that's yeah. good. It's amazing. Wow. What a relief. It is. Amazing. It's so scary. And it's amazing how good. Hari Hari. Oh, thank you, thank you. Namah Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitin 
Namine. Little help. Vishnu Padaya, Vishnu Prasthaya Bhutale. Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirishesha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadana Shivasari Gaura Pakarina
Shri Sri Vrindavan Nam Ki Jai, Sri Mayapur Nam Dittam Ki Jai, Sri Jagannath Puri Dham Ki Jai, Tulsi Devi Bhakti Devi Ki Jai, Jumna Devi Ganga Devi Ki Jai, Sambeda Bhakti Vinda Ki Jai. All glories to the sum of devotees. All glories to the sum of devotees. All glories to the sum of devotees. Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bo. Namaste Narasimhaya Namaste Narasimhaya Oh, 
had a long day today, but very wonderful, right? Yes. And uh, I believe the kids had the m even more wonderful time because they had the space and they saw that, uh, do you know how many more community members are around? So it was actually truly wonderful. We very much enjoyed each and everyone's association. And we, well, that's nice to see your enthusiasm. Most of you have made it to the temple today for the evening program. So we welcome our all the guests for the evening Sunday feast program. Thank you very much for coming back. And we also thank our Sunday feast uh, speaker, His Grace Vaisheshika Prabhu. He enlightened us with a wonderful lecture. It is indeed also a good fortune of ours to have Mother Nirkula here at ISV on Mother's Day. <laughs> also, we'd like to thank Jai Kanaya Prabhu for leading a wonderful RG. <laughs> I do see we have some devotees who are the new newcomers and here for the first time. If you are, please raise your hand. And do let us know if we can be any help or we can make you feel comfortable or want to know more about our ISV programs. Uh, we'll be happy to you know, put you in a group where you can get all the information. I do see also a surprise visit from my cousin, Ruzu, and my aunt and uncle. <laughs> I didn't know that they are here and they're visiting. So welcome, good to have you. And I have, I was told that there's a plenty of prasadam and also the plenty of service afterwards. So, <laughs> so without a fail, you have plenty to share with each other. So if you have some time after prasadam, do come in the kitchen and help us out. We're definitely missing Hari Sankirtan Prabhu. But we also want her to express our love to him, saying that we got you covered, right? So please come forward. Uh, you can ask myself, Bhaktivasal Prabhu, who is also visiting us from Alachwa. <laughs> and I would just take a quick brief moment to thank all the devotees like Venudari Prabhu and his team who helped us out to transport all the things that we needed to make the today's picnic possible and wonderful. So please give a big round of applause to Venudari Prabhu. Okay. We have two sponsors today. We have Manisha who is sponsoring because her father passed away on Friday. And she wanted us to pray, Vaishnavas to pray for his safe passage. So, Monisha, if you are here, would you like to say anything? Or I believe you are also sponsoring for your daughter Auni and Aunish birthday. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Here we are here 
We have a lot of support systems, so do reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you. Also, we have one more sponsor. He can't be here today, but he did mention that his friends are here. Uh, I believe his name, Sh Shai Vajah Prabhu. Is that, is that right? Did I say it right? We do have some Mangalarti Mahaprasadam suite for Monisha and the uh, Sai Vajah Prabhu family. We will be happy to give you. Please collect from us afterwards. And please let us know if it can be any support. If you would like to sponsor feast or you would not want to know what the sponsoring feast or serving prasadam is, we'll be happy to help you. We also have a book table outside. Please connect with our devotees. If you would like to know more about Srila Prabhupada's books, we'll be happy to help you with that. Without a delay, we would just thank last uh, our broadcast team, and then we'll go into prasadam prayers. Yes, Prabhu. Oh, we have a BTG announcement. Hi, Krishna. Most of you know about uh, Back to Godhead magazine. It was started by Srila Prabhupada way back in 1944, and it has been actively running uh, from then. It's more than 75 years now. And uh, to keep it actively running, we need subscribers. So please do subscribe. Uh, it's it's bi-monthly magazine. It uh, it uh, covers more a uh, lot of aspects of spirituality and how to practice. And uh, to subscribe, please go to uh, the link uh, bbtacademic.com shop uh, and search for Back to Godhead magazine. Uh, uh, <laughs> the QR code for the same will be displayed after Prasadam players. You can scan and subscribe. Thank you. What does it, what does it mean? 20 to 100? Uh, you don't have to. Uh, this year we made it such that you don't have to subscribe Sorry. actively every, every year. So you can subscribe for five years in ahead of time. So you don't have to renew every year. OK. Also, you can subscribe for your friends, families, well wishes. Or you can just give $100 per magazine. Yes. <laughs> it's a good idea because when you get a subscription, you'll forget about it because it's so inexpensive anyway. It's a, it, uh, you won't even notice it. You can't buy a salad for that much here in <laughs> California. But, you know, you put $100 and then it reminds you every uh, couple of months that uh, Krishna's there protecting you, watching over you and your family. And then it, it's in the house. And instead of looking at some distraction, then the magazine's there and you start going through the magazine. Next time you'll, you'll settle into your chair. Two hours later, you'll be reading the articles. And then next thing you know, you're thinking of Krishna, you dream about Krishna, you wake up the next day and you, you become empowered by reading Back to Godhead magazine. It's a magazine the prophet started in India and then when he got himself to America, which was no easy feat. Then when he got here, he restarted it. And the way he restarted it was about 10 devotees in the basement and they just mimeographed. You don't even know what that is, do you? Mimeograph. It was this, before the copy machine came out. And they would mimeograph on eight and a half by 11 sheets and then they would uh, collate them themselves and staple them together and then go and distribute them to the public. So. The, this magazine has uh, a long history and a legacy to fulfill, too. So when it comes into your house, it gives special power. I have a lot of passion for it because I was a seeker when I was in high school, and my friend Richie Corsa brought me a copy of Back to Godhead magazine right to my door and said, I'm not into this stuff, but I know you probably are. And he just like kind of threw it at my door. And then I came out of my room later, and I found it, and I joined the Hare Krishna movement because of that magazine. So it's really important to have. Please, everyone, uh, if you don't take a subscription for yourself because you already have one, then get one for someone else tonight. And let's see how many people are in here. Let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 263 people in here. So this, we should have, by the end of the night, 263 subscriptions to Back to Guided Magazine. What do you say, everybody? Yeah, that's what I say too. Hari Bol. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. 
Now, Avant, thank, uh, thank you, Venudari Prabhu, for tireless effort. And it's just nice to see now we have QRF code, and you have taken this whole BTG to next level to subscribe. That's a really labor of love we can see here. Thank you very much again. Now, Avantika will announce who cooked the prashadam. Hey, Krishna. Today's prashadam was cooked by Ujjvala Rasa Mataji, Tripti Mataji, Rasa Amrita Sesha Prabhu, Shyamalangi Mataji, Tadiya Seva Prabhu, and Devyanand Prabhu. Prashadam prayers. These prayers are very special. They're in Bengali, and so it's a very sweet language, as you know. And it was written by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who's a great acharya in the line coming from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And in this song, he talks about the importance of honoring prasadam. Sayan Amrita Pao. So Pao means to, to take with reverence the remnants of the food comes from Krishna. Why? Because in the practice of yoga, the hardest sense to overcome is the tongue. But Krishna's very kind and he's given us Krishna prasadam. So by honoring that prasadam, the tongue becomes conquered. And the Srimad Bhagavatam says, if you can conquer the tongue, then all the other senses are conquered. If you don't conquer the tongue, then it doesn't matter what else you're doing, then it's known that your senses aren't conquered yet. So he says, this is a rare opportunity. We should glorify Lord Chaitanya, Lord Yananda, Radha and Krishna, and honor this prasadam with great joy. So we'll sing this in a special tune, and it's really joyful, and everyone can join along, or just clap along. No, don't clap, just listen. Shari Radvicha Ja Jorindriya Sahika Gile Pele Vishaya Shagore Tarma Jeki Mayati Lova Vishu Gurmati Sake Jeta Sakita Shamshahare Prashadam would be served in the picnic area. You go out this door and take a sharp right, and you'll see it right in front of you. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. How are you?